Appamata and its programs are supported by your generosity and your generosity and support makes such a difference. You can find a link for contributions on the website at appamata.org. Thank you. Well, let's continue our uh, working with uh, Joko's Way of Zen. Thanks to Lori for uh, setting it up so brilliantly yesterday. One of the quotes that she mentioned in her talk from the new book, Ordinary Wonder, which just came out. Right, so this is, we're, we're pulling a lot of materials from this book, Ordinary Wonder. And one of the quotes that Lori used yesterday was, just being the way we are enables us to transform if you can see and experience it. Just being the way we are enables us to transform. But there's a, a caveat at the end, there's a but, right? If you can see and experience it, right? So if you can't see and experience it, she's saying just being who you are, just being the way we are, that's not gonna transform you. That's just you acting out your normal crap, right? <laughs> Right? That's, that's blending with it in some, some terms we use of being blended with the part, right? That's our habitual reactive patterns. But if you can see it and experience it, just being the way we are enables us to transform. Right? So it seems like in that quote, the, uh, the key to the transformation is the seeing and experiencing. It's the witnessing presence. So I'm going to try and put a bow on our, our weekend of being with Joko. And I'm going to summarize her philosophy or her outlook towards practice. I'm going to give you what she says about the stages of practice. And then I'm going to talk about um, her process of how to go through these stages of what we're doing. Right? So philosophy, kind of the approach, the stages, and the process. Her philosophical view, or that's the way, those are my words, you know, but the way she seems to, to see this practice is first that desire is human. We want life to go our way. We have desires. We want life to be a certain way. Right? And that's fine to a point, but if that's all it is, it's ultimately unsatisfying. Right? Pursuing comfort is fine, right? Um, if something's making you uncomfortable, you're gonna have a human desire to remedy it, right? To get the thorn out of your shoe. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. If that's all our life is, is constantly chasing uh, comfort, convenience, okayness, making everything just so, that's going to blind us to the joy that's outside of comfort. So desire is human. That's the first point. The second point we already talked about, joy is everywhere. Joy is what's happening now, minus our opinions of it. So point one, desire is human, right? But there's a warning that uh, don't get tangled up in it. You'll miss too much. Joy is what's happening now, minus our opinions of it. 
So the ground of our life is joy. Have, have any of you had, you know, you, you guys are obviously here at a meditation intensive, so you've been through this. Uh, I know it's not your first time. You know, we have these little openings where we get a shift in our, maybe our consciousness a little bit. Um, we see things differently that can often happen, you know, as a, as a result of being in an intensive or having an opening where all of a sudden, you know, the tree looks more amazing, the same tree in the front yard, you know, things are full of wonder. Anybody have those little moments? Right? Right? Good because hopefully that gives you an idea of what she's talking about, that the joy is what's happening now, minus our opinion of it. When you looked at that tree, and when you had that little opening, and you felt the wonder of it, there was nothing different in that moment, right? It was the tree didn't magically change from the day before, right? It's just you found that space where you weren't judging it, or Sarah, you weren't, you weren't thinking about, uh, having to trim the tree, dang, that tree needs trimming, right? <laughs> right? If you have that moment where you aren't, you're, you're existing underneath all, and around all those thoughts, um, there's joy there. Third, freedom is being just who we are. Experiencing it. Freedom is being just who we are. But again, it's when we're experiencing it, not when we're thinking about it, not when we're judging it, not when we're trying to experience it, because then, you know, then we've got a uh, small mind is in charge, trying to have us do it the right way. So that's kind of the, the philosophy, how I would sum up everything you get out of Joko's books. <laughs> you know, desire is human. We're going to have our way of trying to make life fit into how we want it. Joy is the ground of that life. It's what's happening now, minus our opinions of it. And freedom is being just who we are. I mean, we're just experiencing it. It's freedom from our opinions of it, in a way. So I'm going to talk about the stages of practice now. And this goes back to one of her earlier books, uh, Nothing Special. So in a second, I'm going to talk about the process of going through the stages and what we do. But I thought it would be interesting. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the ox herding pictures, right? That describe kind of the, the different stages along the path. They're used as kind of encouragement to keep people going and having a way to talk about it. So this is kind of Joko's uh, way of doing that verbally, really. So she begins by saying, by talking about a pre-path stage. Um, most persons who have not engaged in any sort of practice are in what I call the pre-path. To be in the pre-path means to be wholly caught up in emotional reactions to life in the view that life is happening to us. We feel out of control, stuck in what seems a bewildering mess. That's pre-path in her terms here. To be caught wholly in the pre-path is to have no inkling that there is any other way to see life. Right? Someone who is caught in the pre-path wouldn't say, I'm caught in the pre-path, 
because they have no other view that there would be another way. That's just, hey, I'm having a bad day or I'm having a good day. So that's pre path. We step onto the path of practice when we begin to recognize our emotional reactions. Right? That when you start to um, not be your emotional reaction, when you start to recognize your emotional reactions. For example, that we're getting angry and beginning to create chaos. That is to step onto the path. So the first stage of practice is this process of becoming aware of our feelings and internal reactions. The first stage is the process of becoming aware of our feelings and the internal reactions. Labeling our thoughts helps us to do this. It's important to be consistent, however, otherwise we'll miss what, much of what goes on in our thoughts and feelings. We need to observe it all. And she talks about how this was her common beginner's instruction to her students. And that the first six months or a year of that could be quite painful for people uh, because they begin to observe, begin to see ourselves more clearly and recognize what we're really doing. Though this is the first stage of practice, elements of it continue into 10 or 15 years of practice. Right? That may be surprising to hear. 10 or 15 years of thought labeling. As we continue to see more and more of ourselves. So this first stage is developing the awareness muscle, developing the witnessing presence. Um, you cannot label a thought until you've stepped back from it, right? It is the, it's the larger mind that labels the thought that the small mind's having. Every time you do that, and you exercise that awareness muscle, that witnessing presence muscle, it gets stronger and quicker. Um, and here's a magical thing. Let's take a, a made up thought here that you might have. He doesn't love me anymore. That is completely different than having the thought that he doesn't love me anymore. It's the same thought. One believes it and one is labeling, one is the larger presence is labeling it as happening. In the second stage, which typically begins from two to five years into practice, we're beginning to break down the emotional states into their physical and mental components. This is the experiencing, right? Second stage, we're beginning to break down the emotional states into their physical and mental components. As we continue to label, as we begin to know what it means to experience ourselves, our bodies, and what we call the external world, the emotional states slowly begin to break down. They never entirely disappear. But they begin to break down. Stage one is beginning to recognize what's going on. Stage two, we're motivated to break down emotional reactions.
and we'll talk about how in a minute, but this is experiencing our, experiencing what's happening, our emotions, our feelings, our bodily sensations, the, the, our, our environment in which the thought is happening or reverberating. In stage three, in stage three, we begin to encounter some moments of pure experiencing without self-centered thought. So pure experiencing in stage three. Just pure experience itself. In some Zen centers, such states are sometimes called enlightenment experiences. In stage four, we slowly move more consistently into a non-dual state of living where the basis is experiential instead of being dominated by false thinking. So stage four is an experiential basis. Instead of being dominated by false thinking. And she says, it's important to remember that there are years and years of practice involved in all of these stages and that there's no lines between them. She's just giving us a, a model of the universe, of this universe. And as all models, they're not right. They're just kind of a little bit of a map. In stage five, 80 to 90% of one's life is lived from an experiential basis. <clears throat> so no different than stage four. She's just talking about how good you're getting at it, right? Or how much more natural it's becoming, how much more time you're spending in that particular way of meeting your experience. 80 to 90% 90, 90 of one's life is lived from an experiential basis. Life is quite different than it used to be. We can say that such a life is one of no self because the little self, the emotional stuff that we've been seeing through and breaking down is largely gone. Pre-path living, being caught in everything and stuck in one's emotional reactions is now impossible. Compassion and appreciation for life and for other people are much stronger. At stage five, it's possible to be a teacher, helping others along the path. Those who have reached stage five are probably already teachers in one way or another. Sentences such as, I am nothing, and therefore I am everything, are no longer meaningless phrases from some book, but things one knows intuitively. And such knowledge is nothing special or strange. Theoretically, there's a sixth stage, that of Buddhahood, where purely experiential living is 100%. I don't know about that, and I doubt that anybody fully achieves this stage. So I thought it was an interesting model, right? Pre-path, being, acting out your emotional reactions, drama, right? Stage one, beginning to be aware of what you're doing, of what you're thinking, labeling the thoughts. Stage two, breaking down the emotional states into their physical and mental components. That's where we're moving beyond the thought labeling and we're feeling the anger in our chest and how it makes our forehead hot and how we feel the blood flow. Breaking, the, breaking it down to emotional reactions and physical and mental components. 
Stage three, pure experiencing without self-centered thought. And really, in her model, that's kind of the last stage. It's just from there on out, you just keep practicing it, strengthening it. She says, by far the most difficult jump to make is from stage one to stage two. To go from that awareness, awareness of our thoughts and what we're doing, and to breaking down the emotional states, the conditioned reactivity into their physical and mental components. We have to move into clear awareness through labeling our thoughts and beginning to feel the tension in the body. To summarize, the first stage is becoming aware of what we are emotionally, including our desire. Sorry. The, the first stage is becoming aware of what we are emotionally, including our desire to control. The second stage is breaking down the emotions into their physical and mental components. When this process becomes a bit more advanced, in the third stage, we begin to have some moments of pure experiencing. The first stage is now quite remote. In the fourth stage, we move more fully from the effort of practice into experiential living. In the fifth stage, the experiential life is now strongly established. One's life is 80 to 90% experiential. Pre-path living, that is being caught in our emotions and taking them out on others, thinking that others are to blame for our troubles is impossible in this stage. From stage two on, compassion and appreciation begins to grow. So that's Joko's model of how we move through this practice life and we find freedom. So we talked about her philosophy that we, like, we want life to go our way, but the joy is actually all around us when we aren't caught in trying to make everything go our way. And that the freedom is being just this, just who we are, the experiencing this freedom. So how? That's the question. How, right? Okay. <clears throat> Number one, sitting. Sitting is to maintain awareness. We were talking earlier during the inquiry portion about um, different kinds of doing and do you do, right? When things come up, when parts come up or... Um, but the basic part of, of sitting is to maintain awareness, is to flex the awareness muscle. We're going to the awareness gym to work it out, right? And so just know, you know, if you, once you start to plan the grocery list, oh, I'm planning the grocery list. I should really decide what I'm gonna to cook tomorrow or else I won't know what to buy. Hmm, what can I cook tomorrow? Now that, now that you're doing that, now that you're dancing with the thought, you've picked it up and you're carrying it, turning it over, that's not sitting anymore. That's not awareness practice. That's something else, right? So sitting is the basic process, and that's to maintain awareness. That's, that's why we start. And we can, we can get into the more uh, esoteric 
kind of philosophical views about shikantaza and uh, it being beyond human agency and that it has no purpose, right? All those are true, right? But this is the uh, Joko, a little mispractical. We're starting there, right? It's because we want you to become aware. Just be okay with that, all right? You can get esoterical later when you're good at awareness. <clears throat> It's nothing fancy. It's just to be alive as a human being. So what are we going to be aware of? We're going to be aware of our mental activities, right? The thought labeling uh, brings that awareness to the mental activities. It's very good at that, right? Just saying, oh, planning, oh, remembering, oh, judging, right? Um, it, it puts a little stamp and helps us release that, you know, let that thought go and see what happens next. So awareness of mental activities, awareness of bodily sensations, and Zen in particular, a lot of instruction is given to the monks on posture, right? There's a very, very specific way to sit, right? And what I always did, when I did orientation a lot here at Appamata, I like to tell, I like to emphasize that because the emphasis on posture, um, when your focus is on your posture, you are focusing on the body. You're focusing on the physical world and not your ideas about it, right? So paying attention to your posture, first, it really helps in your sitting. It helps you to learn how to relax muscles and sit with ease. Mm -hmm but it, it keeps bringing you back to the real world, to the embodied experience. So it's a very good focus area. And then third on the environment. So mental activities, bodily sensations, and the environment. The environment just being everything else in your environment, the bird song, the temperature, the air movement, um, you know, the feeling of the cushion on your bottom. So awareness is the first skill of sitting practice. And we've been through this before, so I'll we'll probably won't, I'll skip through it a bit, but that the first step is in this awareness practice that Joko gives people is thought labeling. to begin to see the activities of our small mind. We get to learn about ourselves. We get to see what's up, what we're up to, what we're really up to. This is from the introduction of the new book by Brenda Beck Hess, her daughter. And she's referring to Joko when she says her. One of her central teachings was for people to label their thoughts. She found we all have our own repeating patterns of thoughts and the patient, often redundant work of becoming aware of these patterns through labeling can help us see our core belief and the basic strategy that derives from it. Once we clarify this, then we slowly develop the skill to see when these patterns arise. It may seem dull and pointless. By the way, if it seems dull and pointless, you should probably be labeling that as having the thought that this is dull and pointless. Right, right, see the difference? <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> anyway, I don't know why I find that so funny. It's often very repetitive, but it helps us uncover our core beliefs. Beginning to know our thoughts helps break our belief in them. Right? The thought's not the problem. Thoughts 
often when people start a Zen practice, um, they come in thinking that their thinking is a problem. Right? The thinking is not the problem. Believing it can be a big problem. Until we know our thoughts a little bit, we believe them. Oh, I'm a worthless person. Nobody loves me. It's a thought. We believe stuff like that. I can't do anything right. Or I'm better than other people. Maybe they don't see it, but I know. When you label your thoughts, you should be like a court reporter, she says. The court reporter, all they're doing is transcribing, right? All they're doing is notating what was, what was said. The court reporter is not thinking about, I can't believe that guy just said that. He shouldn't be talking to the judge that way, you know? If the court reporter starts doing that, she's going to miss all the next three sentences, right? She's got to stay focused on what was said, what was the thought, planning the groceries, and then, then step back and stop. I wonder what's going to happen next, right? And in our example from this morning, we come right back to our body, to our posture and to our walking. That's the foundation, the physical world, the embodied experience. When you notice you had a thought or like, oh, um, I was thinking about trimming the trees. Oh, um, to-do list. Yeah. Come back to the body. So you'd be like the court reporter. Don't engage with the thought. Don't turn it over. Don't try to seek where it came from. Now you're dancing with it. Now, now it's come in and you're serving a tea, like Suzuki Roshi said. Don't serve a tea. Sit down. Talk to me. Where'd you come from? No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't serve a tea. <clears throat> Don't join it and get swept away with it. Here's an interesting quote that Joko says about thought labeling. And she talks about returning, you know, going back to your experience, you know, come back to the body, and then, and then here we go. Then you start to label again. It sounds dull. In a way, it is dull. But it's only dull if you're not interested in your life. If you find it dull, just know you're not interested in your life, but in the mental version that you cook up about it. So, that was only step one, right? <laughs> Sitting, step one, thought labeling. Okay, step two, experiencing our lives. Right, the quote we just said, if you find it dull, just know you're not interested in your life, but in the mental version that you cook up about it. You're interested in the story about it. You're interested in the judgment and the opinions and where they came from. Step two is experiencing our life, our lives, the actual experience of it. In this step, we turn away from the sea of thoughts and feel what is underneath it. Right now, while we think about it, because right? then you're just dancing with the thought again. We feel what's underneath it. We have to be it. This is the crucial second step of practice. This step is the only thing that works if we want to transform a life that goes from chaotic, that goes chaotically from one struggle to another. We have to turn away from the sea of thoughts that we're playing with and begin to really feel what's underneath it. We have to be it. 
when you live, when you begin to live life from this place of honestly, honestly experiencing, even when the experience is painful, a revolution takes place. It will eat away everything that you thought you were. Right? This move towards experiencing away from what we think about the experience will eat away everything that you thought you were. It'll take you towards no self. Or as Joker likes to say, true self. Resistance is a major part of this practice. Joko says, it can take a lot of time, a lot of practice to even know what we are experiencing because we will use everything, all of our conscious and unconscious defenses not to experience what we're experiencing. <clears throat> Resistance is a major part of practice. So this is where the work is, right? It's getting beyond that habitual, not wanting to be with just experience and moving back to being with what's actually there with our actual experience of our body and our emotions, our physical sensations. It can be painful. Or maybe just boring, or maybe we just don't like it. But we have to learn not to run away. This reminds, I wasn't planning to talk about this, but this reminds me of um, one of the, one of the kind of the seminal moments, I'll say, in my practice path um, was that I had been uh, coming to Alpamata and sitting daily for it's probably two years, maybe at the time. And um, one of the things I had, no had you know, started noticing was how much daydreaming I did. Right? That, 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 was, uh, that was kind of one of my go-to things, is just to daydream about, you know, whatever. The content wasn't that important, but and I had been in kind of as you as more and more of this comes into awareness, you know, like Joko says, it can kind of be horrifying, right? Oh my gosh, all I do is daydream all the time. And um, but you know, you keep sitting, and I kept doing a lot of intensives and daily sitting, and I had this moment one day, and I was getting more and more perturbed about my daydreaming that I didn't want it, you know, I was like, that wasn't my aspiration was just to waste my time daydreaming. But, you know, there it was coming back again and again. And I was at work one day, I'm at a big campus. And I was going from one building, the third floor, fourth floor, one building down across the courtyard to another building. And I was coming down the stairwell. And I was daydreaming about something. I don't remember what it was. And I had the little moment where the awareness muscle kicked in and I realized I was daydreaming, right? There, you know, it happens in an instant. All of a sudden you just, you just wake up, right? You know, we don't know where it comes from. Some reason you come back, right? You're out of it for a second. And I saw myself and all of this happened I try not to exaggerate because it's hard to tell that I'll probably all this happened in like um, two or three or four hundredths of a second. It was like less than the blink of the eye. I saw myself come out. I saw that I was daydreaming. I saw what I was daydreaming about. I knew I was walking down the stairs and it was boring. I preferred the daydream. I liked it better. It was more entertaining. I chose it and I went back to it. And that was the first time I saw myself choose 
to daydream. I was like, oh my God, and I stopped walking, I grabbed the handle, I thought I was gonna fall down the stairs. I said, oh my God, I'm choosing it. I'm choosing it. I didn't know that, right? It was the most, it was one of the most amazing things that to, under, to get a glimpse into, you know, your inner working. And I don't know what that had to do with anything, but I just thought of it. <laughs> but it's that awareness muscle, right? It was about her comment about, you know, we don't like to just experience the world. My, my experience of my world was the kind of the dark stairwell and navigating the stairs and where I was going. That was just boring. I just did, I don't want, I didn't want to experience what I was experiencing. I wanted something else. So, step one, sitting and thought labeling to begin to be aware of what we're up to. Step two, experiencing our lives, turning away from the sea of thoughts, starting to feel what's underneath it. What is our actual environment? Step three, everything is our practice. Right? This is Life as it is, the only teacher. Everything is our practice. That's, this step is when we learn that you take that process we're talking about, step one and step two, into everything. Everything the dishes, our work, our loved ones. It's no different. Life as it is, the only teacher. We need to bring that thought labeling and that experiencing our body and our posture while you're driving, while you're in the line at the checkout line at the grocery store. If you want to be free, you should want to be free now, whenever that now is. Do I really want to be free in the stairwell? Is that what this is all about? God, that seems like the worst prize ever for 5,000 hours of meditation. <laughs> Yippee. <laughs> um, I joke though, you know, the freedom we get from not being bound up by our, what we think we're doing is, is, is worth it. <clears throat> so that's the steps. Um, I think that's enough. There's a little more. That was a lot. So we have a few minutes left for any questions or clarifications or observations. Yes, go ahead, Stephanie. Um, I really appreciated what you said about the first um, step to sit uh, to maintain awareness. I had just read something a couple of weeks ago that um, Suzuki Roshi said that that daydreaming is, uh, he called it sightseeing Zazen. And I, like you, when I, I read that phrase and I realized how often that's what I did and it brought me a lot of grief realizing um, this precious time that I had, I was using it just to sightsee through these thoughts. So I really appreciated that reminder. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Mary Beth? I just wanted to say thank you for your story about uh, the awareness of the daydreaming. I had a, a really similar uh, conversation with someone recently, and it's like, I've been doing this for 10 years. And um, just those little moments, I had, a, I had a similar sort of awareness moment is my point. And it, it, um, it kind of speaks to the steps the stages and the, and for me. Um, so I really, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for the story and for this talk, because uh, I, I really um, got a lot out of it. So thank you. Okay, seems complete, I guess. <clears throat> all right, you have it all now. You got the whole, the whole process, right? So now you can all be enlightened just like that. Take it with you. <clears throat>